This is the Geopolitics and Empire podcast, and we're talking to Canadian author Eve Engler. On this episode, we'll be discussing a subject not often talked about, Canadian imperialism and foreign policy, and its current application uh, in Venezuela, among other places. Uh, thanks for coming back, Eve. Thanks for having me. Before we start, I'd like to mention, you know, I spoke to Eve about five years ago. I was teaching an undergraduate course on North American politics in Mexico, and I had assigned some chapters from his book, Black Book on Canadian Foreign Policy, as reading material for students. Uh, the students and I then Skyped with Eve, and that interview, if people want to see, is, is up on YouTube. I'll put the link in the description. It was on my first channel called Dissident Thinker, which was kind of like... Um, that was the evolution of geopolitics and empire. That was the, the prototype. Uh, and I felt using Skype in such a way was important to get these themes across to students because they can interact uh, with the authors of the material. Um, and other re reading material that I assigned was a speech by Canadian ambassador Alan Gottlieb, which in that speech, he basically explained how Canadian foreign policy function as a supporting arm of U.S. foreign policy, that it essentially does not have an independent foreign policy. And Eve will tell us more about this. But I wanted to quote a section of Alan Gottlieb's speech. He said, quote, it is my thesis that over the past 60 years, Canada's strategies on the international plane have largely been driven by our concerns about our relationship with the United States. In the drama of Canada's foreign policy, the U.S. is always the principal actor. At the table where Canadians prepare the ingredients of their foreign policy, the U.S. is always the principal guest. When Canadians assemble to discuss their needs and destiny, the specter of the U.S. is always there to dominate their thoughts. And in Eve's um, latest book, uh, he cited Foreign Minister Bill Graham, who said, there is a limit to how much we can constantly say no to the political masters uh, in Washington. Um, and so, uh, interestingly enough, I did do an interview with uh, Alan Gottlieb on North American integration. It's in our archive. It wasn't that great because it was early on in my uh, podcasting and he's into his 90s uh, right now. Um, but I found, you know, regarding critical, a critical take on Canadian foreign policy and imperialism, I found Eve Engler to be one of the very few and best sources for this information uh, and analysis. and. Um, so before we get into it, can you first Eve, give us an idea of how many analysts such as yourself, whether from the left or the right, are critically questioning Canadian foreign policy? Um, it, well, not, not that many, certainly from a, from a critical perspective. Uh, there is a, it's a very uh, sort of a narrow range of debate in the, uh, in the dominant media, certainly around Canadian foreign policy, but there is a, a growing number of, um, of, of uh, critics of Canadian foreign policy from the left. There's a sort of an upsurge of books dealing with different elements of Canada's uh, foreign policy in the recent years that are come from a more critical perspective. Um, but, um, but it's, uh, it's a subject that, um, y you know, there's almost a consensus in the, in the dominant media on, on the, on the subject, but there's maybe a bit of a growing, uh, uh, uh sort of activist kind of, uh, literature on, on some of these issues. Um, but, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm of the opinion that, um, that Canadians are some of the most confused people in the world about their country's role in the world. Canadians overwhelmingly think their country's a force for good in the world when, uh, history and current affairs show that Canada's foreign policy is very much driven by empire, historically British, today American, and Canadian corporate interests. That's overwhelming what drives Canadian foreign policy. Um, but, uh, but, you know, polls have shown that over 90% of Canadians think this country is, you know, trying to bring democracy around the world, trying to, uh, you know, help the poor, uh, and, you know, be a benevolent international, uh, uh actor. So l let's talk a bit, define a bit, uh, this empire. So I, I cited Alan Gottlieb and Foreign Minister Graham, uh, and, you know, most people are familiar with. Pax Americana, the American Empire, as you mentioned, that's a running theme of this podcast. But could you kind of summarize for us, lay out, how would you explain Canadian imperialism uh, and its role within the American Empire? Yeah, I mean, I would find, I, my um, feeling is that, my analysis is that the broad, the big picture 
Canadian foreign policy decisions, like going to war, like the war in Afghanistan, Canada sending uh, I think about 40,000 troops to Afghanistan over, over a decade. Um, that was m primarily motivated by Canada's tie to, uh, to Washington. The, the fact that Canada is part of NATO, one of the founding, three founding members of NATO going back to 1949, that Canada was, um, uh, you know, very much uh, is, is, you know, works hand in hand, the military, the American military have very tight relations. So the big picture foreign policy uh, issues are mostly ex Canada, Canada's uh, participation is mostly explain, explained by Canada's ties to, U, to the U.S. empire. Now, on a day-to-day -day basis, most of what Canadian foreign policy is, you know, what the Canadian embassy does in, in, uh, in Quito, Ecuador, or what the Canadian trade commissioners are doing, that's really about advancing Canadian corporate interests. Uh, the, you know, the different bilateral trade and uh, bilateral investment agreements, the Canadian government signing, on and on and on. Um, and those are, you know, it's, it's Canadian corporate interest. Canada is this massive mining power, right? Canada's the biggest mining power in the world, right? 50 to 75% of the world's mining companies are either based in, in, in Canada or listed on Canadian stock exchanges. So and a very important part of Canadian uh, foreign policy in Africa and Latin America is advancing the interests of Canadian mining companies. Um, so that's, I think, the sort of big picture. And you know, so you take something like Venezuela today, which I think we might go into more detail later on about, um, it, it's, you know, Canada is doing it because uh, Canada is trying to overthrow Venezuela's government because that's something the Trump administration wants. So it's working alongside the Trump administration. But simultaneously, you have uh, major uh, Canadian um, uh, mining interests that are, have been hostile to, to the Chavez government before Maduro um, and who want at the massive gold interests uh, um, uh, in, in Venezuela. Um, so, uh, so I think that's the, the thrust of what's, uh, what's driving uh, Canadian foreign policy. On one hand, empire, um, supporting American empire. Other hand, uh, advancing Canadian corporate interests abroad. And in your book, uh, you, you talk a lot, a lot about the history. You go back, you know, about a, a century in some regards. And could you just briefly mention, the, the, you know, in the 20th century, the, the history of the Canadian uh, imperialism? You know, you mentioned NATO. So... Th their role there and so can you just give us a few examples of the 20th century how Canada has been um, Canada's backbone of its imperialism yeah well first of all we, we're gonna remember that Canada was uh, a dominion of the British Empire and it was a dominion of the British Empire that that um, you know was was close to the Imperial Center in 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 in, uh, in London uh, so Canada sent troops to the South Africa during the Boer War the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, Canada sent huge numbers of troops to fight during World War I uh, uh, and World War II. Both of them, all three of those was really very much to support British uh, imperialism. Now, uh, during World War, World War II and after World War II, Canada begins to shift m away from its alignment with uh, British imperialism towards uh, uh, U.S. imperialism. During World War II, uh, Canada uh, comes out of World War II quite uh, quite strong uh, uh, and uh, and so um, it's a major creditor nation uh, whereas much of Europe is sort of is you know destroyed um, um, so sort there's of huge debts that are owed to Canada uh, Canada's military the Canadian economy has you know huge uh, military production during World War two so Canada Canada's uh, you know kind of quite quite powerful um, uh, at that point and uh, and in, in uh, 1948, uh, Canadian officials with British and American officials are, are uh, you know, involved in secret meetings to set up NATO. And, um, and uh, Ottawa is very much, uh, you know, right at the core of, 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 uh, of uh, global imperialism uh, at, at that point. And I think that that very much, you know, continues uh, over the years. Canada sends 27,000 troops to fight in Korea uh, during the early 1950s, a terrible war that led to millions and millions of people being killed. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, Canada provides support, despite there's a lot of mythology in this country, provides support for most um, uh, U.S. Uh, uh, 
warfare, like for instance, Vietnam, uh, Canada provides all kinds of different support for the U.S. war in Vietnam, even though now Canadian officials try to present Canada have, as having been against the war in Vietnam, which is totally uh, uh, ahistorical. Um, and then that basically continues on in, you know, in the early 1990s, uh, Canada is one of the uh, countries that joined to the U.S. in, in the first uh, war against Iraq, uh, the bombing of uh, uh, the former Yugoslavia in 1999, uh, Afghanistan, uh, Haiti overthrows, Haiti's elected government in 2004, Canada, the U.S., and France, uh, um, uh, bombing of Libya in 2011. So, so there's, you know, many examples of Canadian uh, um, uh, joining U.S.-led wars, uh, and uh, and throughout this time, uh, Canada's so, you know a, a, a staunch uh, anti-communist uh, country um, is supporting U.S. Uh, you know softly supporting U.S. Uh, coups in you know, Chile in 1973 against uh, Salvador Allende against uh, Arbenz in, in Guatemala um, and 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 basically is you know align its its policy is aligned um, with Washington's uh, policy in these different places um, and 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 I, my you know sort of at a big picture level there's a there's a lot of people who who believe that uh, a lot of progressive people in Canada who say that well Canada just is just forced to do all this stuff that the the, the big bad Americans kind of force uh, Ottawa and Canadian politicians to to you know pursue this imperial policy. Um, and I, I don't see it exactly like that. I mean, there's no doubt there's a lot of pressure coming from Washington and that Canada's policy is aligned with Washington. But I see it more from the perspective that the Canadian elite see the world and profit from the world in a very similar way to the U.S. elite. And that the, the, that the Canadian um, elite have gone from um, a, an appendage of the imperial center, uh, the British Empire, to an appendage of the imperial center, the U.S. Empire. And that they, they have a, uh, um, uh, they are, you know, they are, they do well um, by, uh, by U.S. Uh, imperialism. And they have a, and they have a sort of special place in that, in that uh, imperialism. Unlike, you know, a country like Mexico, which geographically is, is as close to the U.S., um, Mexico hasn't gone along with as, as much of American imperialism around the world. And, and, uh, um, and, and I think that the Mexican elite are not uh, uh, as much tied into the, you know, the power centers in Washington and, and, you know, benefiting from, uh, there's, you know, there's a racial component to that. Uh, there's a linguistic component to that. There's just a simple, you know, corporate relationship. And I've detailed that in some of my books of different ties between prominent, um, uh, officials in, uh, in, in the U S and in Canada. And that continues right up until today with, with the Trump administration. And there's one story from the global mail that talked about how many, uh, if, if Donald Trump was to would become hostile to Canada, how many important Canadian capitalists have uh, homes and near his home in, in uh, southern Florida and how, how many different connections Canada has to influencing the Trump administration. Um, so, so that, I think, is sort of at a very broad brush uh, sort of the history of, uh, of Canadian imperialism and ties to uh, the American and British Empire. Yeah, and, and regarding Mexico, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I've interviewed Jefferson Morley a few times, and he wrote the book Our Man in Mexico based on declassified documents that showed uh, at least three Mexican presidents were paid uh, CIA uh, agents. So, I mean, there definitely is a connection there, but I would agree it's not uh, as close as with Canada. Uh, let's look at some examples. Haiti, uh, I was thinking, because you wrote a book about Haiti, and you mentioned it in, in, in your new book, um, although not in great uh, detail, and to talk about Venezuela, but first Haiti. Um, and because those two are interrelated, because I think we're seeing this new Monroe Doctrine. Um, you know, I was on Radio Sputnik uh, interviewed, I think like January 24th, the first night of the current Venezuela coup. Uh, and I used, I, I said it's a new Monroe Doctrine. And then, you know, it's, it's, it's obvious. And so, I think a lot of people might not be not know about the the Haitian coup. I think it was two thousand six. Uh, so can you kind of break that down for us? What what happened there? We're told again the the president was a bad guy. We have to go in and and, and overthrow him. Um, so can you break that down for us a bit? Yeah, and, and so on February 29th, two thousand four, uh, almost basically fifteen years ago. Uh, uh, U.S. Marines in the middle of the night took the elected president Jean Bertrand Aristide uh, from his home um, 
and plane and dumped him in the Central African Republic. Uh, he, Aristide said he was kidnapped by U.S. Marines, that's the word he used. Um, at that time, there were Canadian Special Forces uh, securing the uh, Paul Prince Airport. Uh, 30 Canadian Special Forces, according to an uh, Agence France Press uh, uh, story. Um, and uh, 13 months before Aristide was uh, overthrown, uh, they, uh, there was a meeting held uh, just outside of Ottawa, uh, Beach Lake, um, on uh, January 31st and February, February 1st of uh, 2003. Um, later, secret meeting, uh, later uh, reported on in uh, Quebec's main uh, news weekly, L'Actualité. And at that meeting, they decided that Aristide must go. I should say there was uh, high-level officials uh, from the Bush and George W. Bush administration, from the French government, from the organization of American States. And that meeting was framed as a meeting to discuss Haiti's future. Uh, but no officials from Haiti's uh, uh, government were invited to the meeting. Um, uh, as was reported on uh, six weeks later in, in L'Actualité, uh, they decided that this meeting that Aristide must go. The Haitian uh, military should be uh, recreated and that Haiti should be put, put under UN trusteeship. 13 months after the meeting, um, Aristide was forced out of office by U.S., Canadian, and French forces. Um, the, the country was essentially under U.N. trusteeship, sort of still is today. There was a U.N. occupation uh, for most of the last 15 years. Um, and the Haitian military was partially recreated via the Haitian National Police. Um, so Canada was involved in... in um, in, uh, I would say, you could use the word plotting, I don't know if that's exactly the right word, but consolidating the international forces, primarily the US, France, and Canada, that would perpetrate this uh, overthrow of Haiti's uh, uh, democracy. Not only was the elected president ousted, but there were thousands of other officials, uh, you know, mayors and whatnot across the country that were forced from office. Um, they uh, took a guy who had been living in, in southern Florida for 15 years and put him in put him in place as the head of Haiti. Um, and uh, over the next two years, there was a great deal of political violence. Thousands of people were killed, those mostly in the, in the slum neighborhoods that were supportive of Aristide. Aristide was um, somebody who the Haitian elite hated, uh, long-standing hatred, uh, somebody who was uh, very popular among the poor and still is very popular among the poor. Um, and, uh, um, and it was, uh, you know, uh, Canada was involved at this, uh, not, there were Canadian troops on the ground, 500 Canadian troops on the ground for six months. Uh, Canada led the uh, police component of the UN mission. Um, uh, Canada cut off aid to the uh, Aristide government. And then when you had a, a, a coup government in place, Canada pump, pumped a whole bunch of money, aid money into the country. Um, Canadian police uh, trained, financed the Haitian police. Uh, continued to do that actually right until today, and uh, Canadian officials were involved at all, just at, you know at all levels of the uh, uh, undermining of democracy in Haiti. All different elements of the Canadian state. So you had the military, uh, the Canadian police, or RCMP, or Sûreté du Québec. You had the uh, the uh, uh, aid agency that was heavily involved. You had Canadian diplomats. The first ever trip by a Canadian prime minister to Haiti was not when there was an elected government, but when you had this coup government. Um, NGOs, Canadian NGOs were heavily involved in, 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 in undermining the Aristide government and supporting, uh, legitimating the coup process. Um, so for, on a personal level, the coup in 2004 in Haiti was really what opened my eyes to Canadian foreign policy. I actually had this sort of general uh, 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 idea of Canada as being this benevolent international actor, an idea that most Canadians have. And I was just taken aback by just how um, involved uh, Canada was in this clear, clear uh, uh, imperial crime. Uh, and so, um, and, you know, fast forwarding right up until today with Haiti, uh, you still have a situation where Canada is right at the center of, of undermining the sovereignty in Haiti and, and, and undermining the will of the majority. Haiti, of course, is a country, incredibly class divided country where there's a, just a small elite. Uh, talk about the 1%, it's not even, the, you know, not the 1% there, it's the 0.00001% that own, you know, half the country, uh, very, you know, 10 families, basically. And, um, and the majority, of course, are, are uh, uh, live in, in, in uh, abject, uh, abject poverty. Um, in recent days, in recent weeks, there's been mass protests against this uh, government that has very little legitimacy. And again, Canada has, uh, has, uh, has been 
explicitly aligning with this government that has uh, 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 almost no legitimacy. There's a major uh, general strike uh, early part of, uh, uh, from much of February, and, uh, and Canadian uh, uh, policymakers are very much going to bat for the, for the legitimate government that's 90% of the country wants, uh, wants out. Um, and Canada continues to support the repressive arm of the Haitian state, continues to put all kinds of money into the Haitian police, which have killed dozens and dozens of people in uh, uh, recent efforts to repress the, the popular demonstrations. Um, so really, Canada over the past uh, 15 plus years has been, has been aligned with, uh, certainly with Washington and also with the very retrograde uh, elements of the Haitian elite against the interests of the majority of the poor. And, you know, one of the interests Canada has in Haiti is, is a can Canadian uh, 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 t-shirt maker, Guild and Activewear, one of the biggest blank t-shirt makers in the world. They have major sweatshops in Haiti. And uh, you know, one of the things that the Aristide government did was increasing the minimum wage. So any efforts to pay people Three dollars a day. That's what we're talking about. Going from a dollar and a half a day to three dollars a day. That was uh, that was viewed uh, uh, negatively from the standpoint of Canadian uh, uh, business. Similarly, there's um, significant. Uh, or there are Canadian mining interests that were hostile to the Aristide government that want access to uh, to uh, uh, mineral resources uh, in the country. Um, but uh, but but the the case of Haiti is really a pretty naked example of, uh, of uh, Canadian imperialism over the past 15 years. Right. As you say, that's a naked, clear-cut uh, example. Uh, and then let's jump fast forward 15 years to today uh, and looking at Venezuela. You wrote an article recently um, about Canada weaponizing humanitarian aid, using it as a Trojan horse, as a pretext, and uh, you know, as a way of propaganda to f further demonize the current uh, Venezuelan Government and this is really like a, a newer tactic um, in, in the wars today. Uh, weaponizing humanitarian aid. I, I wrote my master's thesis on, on color revolutions and how NGOs. Again, people think these are all good things. You have some good NGOs, some bad NGOs, and so they're used as vehicles um, for those in power to overthrow foreign countries. And uh, you know, recently I interviewed my professor Alfred Desias who talks about, you know, how humanitarian aid is, is weaponized. So can you tell us about what's happening uh, in Venezuela today and how Canada is involved as well? Yeah, just before getting to that, I do want to say there, Haiti in 2004 was a very clear cut case of Canadian aid money going to NGOs to destabilize an elected government and to uh, perpetrate a coup, and including lots of groups that, that claim to be very left wing. One group here in, in Montreal called Alternatives, um, which is a major uh, a partner of the so World Social Forum. Um, this was a, the, the uh, it was actually, for, on a personal level, it was, a, it was, it was totally uh, uh, revealing to see how NGOs uh, were used to destabilize and overthrow elected government. Because I actually went, I went to the World Social Forum back in 2002 or 2003 with this group alternatives, and then to see how they became very much aligned with uh, the coup, coup effort in Haiti um, was, was a quite, a, quite a fascinating uh, sort of uh, experience. But yeah, up in, you know, in, in, in terms of today in, in, in Venezuela, um, you have uh, Canada's aid money to Venezuela was couple components to it. One is that Canada has been supporting opposition groups in Venezuela for, for more than a decade. Uh, not huge amounts of money, unlike Haiti, where it was very you know, major player, substantive amounts of money that had a major impact on Haitian political life. I would say it's, 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 it's less significant in the case of uh, Venezuela, but Canada has been, been uh, funding opposition groups in Venezuela since at least 2004. We have uh, known examples of that groups that aligned with the 2002 coup against, uh, against, uh, against Hugo Chavez. Um, and, uh, and so that, that's one part of the sort of weaponizing aid in Venezuela. But the, but the main part in, in you know, recent days and recent weeks is this, this effort that uh, was launched by uh, Juan Guaido with the Americans uh, and this whole uh, business about trying to bring uh, humanitarian aid into into uh, Venezuela from from Colombia, from the border, and, and from from Brazil, Canada announced at the uh, Lima Group um, of uh, groups uh, countries opposed to the Venezuelan government back 
at the start of uh, uh, February, they announced uh, $53 million in, in aid, which is actually the biggest announcement of, of aid uh, to, uh, to Venezuela. And they said that money was going to go via Colombia and, and via uh, uh, Brazil uh, um, into, into, uh, into Venezuela. And, and it was clearly this whole aid uh, uh, you know, convoy effort was designed to try to um, elicit some sort of confrontation between, between the opposition and the, uh, the Venezuelan military. It was also designed to, to um, uh, portray the Maduro government negatively, you know, to sort of exaggerate the level of, of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, poverty in the country. Um, there's no doubt there's an economic crisis in, in Venezuela, but the country is not, you know, people aren't just starving uh, in every street corner like they're trying to portray with this effort to bring uh, uh, humanitarian aid into the country. Um, and 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 it goes. There's a there's a history to this, and and I and I sort of in in, a, in that article I, I lay out the history of the connection between uh, Canadian uh, uh, aid and military intervention. I call it the uh, aid intervention principle, or wherever U.S. and Canadian troops are killing people, Canada tends to provide aid, and that goes right back to the Korean War, early 1950s. Uh, in Vietnam, Canada provided all kinds of aid to support U.S. efforts in South Vietnam. Uh, in a, Iraq in the early 1990s, and then very obviously in the mid 2000s, the main recipients, the top recipients of Canadian aid, from around 2003 to 2008, were uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Haiti. Well, what was going on in in those three countries? Well, there were Canadian or U.S. troops occupying all those three countries, and so Canadian aid money follows. Uh, uh, where Canadian uh, military goes. And so that just sort of shows how aid is not a, you know, just some sort of uh, generalized humanitarian thing, but it's really my, very much a geopolitical tool. And that's been the case for Canadian aid going back to the founding of Canadian aid in the uh, early 1950s. Um, and, but, but a lot of people, uh, including in the case of Venezuela, including groups that were, that were critical of Canada's role in the, uh, in, this very aggressive role in trying to uh, oust the Maduro government. I'm speaking specifically about the largest uh, union in the country that was has been quite principled in its opposition to Canada's effort to overthrow the Maduro government. They um, they, got, they got a lot of heat from the uh, from the dominant media in this country over their position uh, against the coup, uh, attempted coup in, in in Venezuela. And but in their in their sort of um, uh, communications, they've said that, well, we oppose Canada's role in, in trying to oust the Maduro government, but we support uh, efforts to, to, uh, to send aid. Um, so, 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 so progressive-minded uh, organizations and individuals in this country have this concept of aid as just a sort of, because it's called aid, it therefore ipso facto is a positive thing. But um, uh, as is, uh, many examples have been, uh, that I that have shown in Canadian uh, um, foreign policy history, aid has often been used in the case of Haiti. It was used to, to build up a, a police force that were killing protesters calling for democracy. In the case of Venezuela today, it's designed not to help Venezuelans, but designed to try to undermine and oust the, uh, the legitimate uh, uh, government. Um, and so I think that it's very important for, um, for uh, uh, critics of uh, world affairs to disabuse ourselves of, of this idea that just because it's called aid, it therefore is some sort of uh, uh, you know uh, thing that we should we should uh, support. Definitely. And I, I, next, I want to get into talk a little bit about propaganda. You you wrote a book about that. Uh, in fact, um, your new book, Left Right, I think is an extension. Uh, I listened to one of your speeches, and you said it's kind of like. Uh, an extension of that book, Propaganda, um, and how the, the powers that influence policymaking, think tanks, um, NGOs, and it's not just, uh, and the problems that people face uh, when, you know, independent critics as well, alternative media, and this is not just from the left, because I recently interviewed a moderate or conservative uh, academ academic, I'm not sure, Paul Robinson of the University of Ottawa, uh, and we were talking about Russia uh, and, you know, there's this whole anti-Russia thing going on. Um, and he said that think tanks put a, put a, tried to smear him. Canadian think tank tried to smear him and put him on the blacklist because he didn't jump on the anti-Russia uh, hysteria bandwagon. And he wanted to look at things more r with a rational, logical 
scientific factual approach rather than just buy into all this media hysteria that's going on that's pro pro war uh so we see like across the spectrum uh problems that people face that critical thinkers uh face and you know what that's one reason i kind of chose not to make a professional career uh in academia or or think tanks or, or politics and would rather went into education and paul craig roberts uh, he, he just wrote a brief article uh yesterday that he said in order for a person to have a sterling reputation or career a person has to lie and support the ruling ideology and official explanations uh, and as well you wrote in your book that canada's uh role in the world takes more effort to uncover and the extra work is often bad for one's career. So can you tell us a little bit about the system of propaganda from, from your view, your research uh, in Canada and beyond? Yeah, in, in, in a book I did uh, uh, called The Propaganda System, How Canada's Government, Corporation, Media and Academia Sell War and Exploitation. I try to basically uh, explain why 90 plus percent of the population supports, believes that Canada is a force for good in the world and supports, uh, uh, essentially supports Canadian foreign policy. And there's, <clears throat> it, it, you know, it's multifaceted in, in terms of the explaining um, the, the system of, of, um, of uh, information dissemination and how that's skewed towards uh, power. Um, uh, obviously, the most important element to that is the dominant media. And if you sort of look into the dominant media in this country and who owns the dominant media, it's owned by a, a few major corporations. Um, <clears throat> and then there's all kinds of ways in which, uh, you know, the, the biggest uh, public relations entity in the country is the Canadian military, right? So the Canadian military uh, spends hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars a year in terms of uh, uh, promoting its perspective on world affairs in terms of portraying itself positively. And it has like something like 650 people who are full-time employees in, in public relations. Well, how many people are, are full-time employees in the peace movement for public relations? None, <laughs> maybe one, and maybe one or two. Uh, uh, so so this Im the imbalance of resources. So the, the military just has the ability to you know, send out press releases, organize events, uh, communicate with journalists, uh, on and on and on. All these things that, that, that uh, go to, to influencing uh, what's, in, what's in the dominant media. Um, then if you go into the different think tanks, uh, academic institutions, um, the, the military actually funds a, a whole swath of academia, a long funded whole swath of academia that tends to be uh, very uh, aligned with its uh, view of the uh, world affairs. Um, the uh, most important uh, 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 foreign policy uh, academic uh, institution in the country, the, the Monk uh, uh, School of Global Affairs at the University of Toronto, you know, right downtown Toronto in the, the most important city the, of, of the country. Um, well, it was set up by the founder of Barrick Gold the biggest, uh, 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 at one point, the biggest gold mining company in the world. Uh, this guy, Peter Monk, who had very uh, pro, uh, you know, pro Augusto Pinochet in Chile, uh, uh, hot, vehemently hostile to Hugo Chavez in, in, in Venezuela, someone who has very right-wing views. And he, and he set up the, 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 um, the School of Global Affairs very explicitly um, uh, in a way that maintained his power, uh, his how the funding mechanism worked was to maintain his influence over over the uh, school's uh, 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 operations. Um, and so you just go you go down the line and you start looking at like you know most of the uh, the different organizations in this country, the Canadian Council for the Americas, the Canadian Council on Africa. These are organizations that are dominated by corporations. Uh, they're supposed to be, you know, producing sort of objective uh, information about Canada's role in these places. Um, but of course, that's that's skewed towards uh, 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 the corporate perspective, towards power. And then if you go down even into, you know, the NGOs, which a lot of people view as, as sort of uh, left wing or progressive, well, they get most of the money from the from the Canadian aid agency. And the Canadian aid agency, there's a whole history of when an NGO has begun to move too far away from the official line on, on foreign policy decisions, um, they just cut their funding. And those organizations are examples where they just literally 
basically disappear overnight because they're getting 60, 70 percent of the funding from the government. And, and, um, and, you know, when the government says enough's enough, uh, that, that ends. Uh, that has obviously a huge chill effect in the, the NGO world. So, so there, there is um, the, the, the obviously the most important element is the dominant media and there's a whole history that I detailed the book of, of, you know, open um, censorship, right? Like during, during uh, World War I, during uh, World War II, during the Korean War, uh, there was open censorship of the media. Um, and, and the military has very elaborate um, uh, strategies to shape uh, 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 news coverage of, of Canadian warfare. And they, they spend a great deal of intellectual resources, a great deal of financial resources in terms of thinking about uh, developing these strategies to, to shape uh, media coverage of, of, of uh, warfare. So um, when you put it all together, um, it's not a surprise that uh, you know, 90% of the population thinks this country is a benevolent uh, international actor because that's basically the only thing you're hearing from all of the different institutions that are that are that are um, disseminating information about Canada's role in the world. They uh, they um, overwhelmingly uh, basically uh, uh, portray um, Canada as a sort of a, a benevolent force, uh, and that of course allows the, the decision makers to do what they want to do uh, and uh, and just. Um, get, get away with their imperial policies, get away with uh, advancing the interests of corporations abroad. And, and you know, one, one of the um, last remaining top, uh, topics I wanted to talk about were R2P, responsibility to protect, and something I learned from your book, which I was not aware of, the will to intervene, which is, uh, I guess, a continuation of R2P. And I was deeply interested in R2P when I was uh, in graduate school. Uh, and basically, it's, you know, I guess my take on R2B uh, would be you know, years ago when the U.S. was just starting these these wars, they would just use the TV. And I mean, they were just, I think, very brash about it and just, you know, go into Iraq and all these places. And with the Internet slowly coming about and people finding these alter, alternate sources of uh, information, it was maybe getting harder to, to, to do that. And so they've tried to establish kind of, uh, as you've talked about this propaganda, this kind of uh, inter international law uh, pretext responsibility to, to protect that they want to kind of uh, encode uh, and use that as a justification to go, you know, invade Libya or, or, or Venezuela. Uh, and then, so can you tell us a little bit about your thoughts on R2P as well as the, the will to intervene? Yeah, so responsibility to protect is actually, you know, Canada is right at the center of pushing uh, the doctrine internationally. Uh, there was, uh, after the uh, bombing of uh, the former Yugoslavia in the late 90s, uh, a Canadian uh, foreign minister, Lloyd Axworthy, who was very much presented as this liberal uh, uh, foreign minister, uh, was, uh, was very a uh, big proponent of pushing this through the international, uh, through the UN, attempting to push it through the UN. And, and, and there's a big uh, commission that was set up, and Canadian uh, actors put a, a big part in that. And and um, the uh, uh, Paul Martin government in the mid 2000s uh, tried to get the UN to adopt uh, the responsibility to protect doctrine, which was failed. Um, but they, they basically what the responsibility direct says is that when there is massive human rights violations taking place, somebody take place somewhere, uh, it's the, uh, responsibility to, of the international community to intervene over and above, uh, state sovereignty. So it's try to redefine international law, um, uh, in that way. And, uh, and you know, in on in sort of on paper, it sort of sounds like not a bad idea. Well, you know, massive human rights violations. Okay, this this uh, amorphous international community will, that you know cares about human beings will just intervene to stop the human rights violations. In practice, what it actually means is it's a tool for the powerful to intervene against the weak. No one said, okay, the U.S. is responsible for hundreds of thousands of deaths in Iraq. Let's send troops into Washington to stop the uh, American killing in Iraq. Um, uh, so now in Canadian foreign policy, it was cited. The responsibility to protect doctrine was cited, even though it was kind of in its, in its uh, uh, early phases of being uh, pushed internationally. It was cited to justify Canada's intervention in Haiti in 2004. 
that led to thousands of people being killed. It went and took a, a already highly impoverished place and made it even more impoverished. Um, but that got cited mostly in sort of private, uh, uh, there's a number of internal government documents that came out about Canada justi justifying intervening and overthrowing uh, Aristide's government in 2004. And it got cited in those documents by Canadian diplomats. In 2011, in Libya, it got cited uh, repeatedly in a very public way. Uh, uh, people like Lloyd Axworth, the former Canadian foreign minister, wrote uh, op-eds in the major uh, Canadian papers justifying intervention in, in Libya. Uh, via the responsibility to protect. Now, what happened in Libya? Of course, uh, uh, seven, eight years later, and, and uh, Lib Libya, you know, thousands, probably tens of thousands of people have been killed. The country continues to be divided. Uh, there continue to be dozens, hundreds, probably, of different sort of armed factions. Um, uh, you went from, you know, a country that had fairly uh, high standards of education and, and uh, social services to a lot of that just being completely destroyed. So the responsibility to protect and this whole sort of humanitarian cover, um, it just, you know, it's a total, it's a farce. It just led to, you know, the humanitarian uh, uh, crisis, really. Um, and now Canadian officials and actually some academics here in Montreal have, uh, have, uh, have tried to push uh, sort of extended, extend the responsibility to protect into something called the win will to intervene, and they have a they have this project uh, based at the university here, and they have tried to intervene in different uh, uh, public kind of affairs. And I think it's partly because uh, there hasn't been the traction in terms of that the UN for the for for adopting responsibility to protect, and it's partly that these these uh, doctrines, they, they like to have them just kind of floating around because they become uh, useful in times when they decide that they you know, want to get rid of a government somewhere. And, and um, the, uh, the Financial Times about five, six months ago had, a, um, I think it may have been the head of the Organization of American States, uh, Luis uh, Amago had an op-ed in the Financial Times uh, basically calling for the responsibility to protect to be to be uh, adopted in Venezuela to to justify overthrowing um, uh, the Nicolas Maduro government uh, uh, there. So these so these doctrines become um, you know sort of these you have these academics who spend their time putting forward these things these doctrines that will then you know the, the politicians and the and the decision makers will will pick up on when they decide that some government uh, is is uh, no longer to their liking and that they should. Uh, they should uh, um, uh, get rid of them. But it, this, the responsibility to expect really aligns with Canada's kind of presentation of itself to the world as this sort of um, liberalish, uh, 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 human rights concerned, uh, not the brash Americans. Um, so we were really right at the forefront of, of, uh, of pushing this type of uh, thinking. But the effect of it is, is really not much different than the, the uh, more sort of brash, open, uh, um, uh, kind of uh, armed uh, intervention. Basically, good cop, bad cop, it, it looks like. Um, you know, in, in the conclusion uh, of your book, one of the conclusions you come to, which I, I would agree with, is that a more um, fairer or justice-centered foreign policy would take uh, decades uh, to form. And I guess it would have to happen first in Washington before uh, it happened in Ottawa. Uh, I mean, I would agree with you because this has gone on for over half a century, for a century now, in the U.S. and it would take the institutions are there in the U.S. We do see a lot of the institutions uh, rotting, and I think we're going to see some kind of new order. The Bretton Woods institutions are are slowly falling apart. Russia and China are are rising, and so I think this is a time of historical tectonic geopolitical change and and, and shift. And so, if you want to comment, uh, 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 anything else you, you you'd want to leave us with. Yeah, well, picking up on that, I mean, I, I think that we we are active agents, right? You know, there, there are these powerful institutional structures that that um, that uh, you know justify these policies that push uh, these sort of uh, anti-human, uh, uh, anti-democratic, uh, imperialist kind of policies. Um, but but there is some there is power. We do have power um, uh, now. Uh, it, what it, we need to we need to activate that power as as individuals, and obviously the first step of that is always 
trying to figure out what's happening, trying to trying to understand what's actually going on. So first step of that is is a sort of information thing, but then it's a you know taking action, and and uh, I'm I'm of the opinion that yes, uh, there are very powerful uh, structures that were against. It's possible to to articulate a more just Canadian foreign policy, and 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 that obviously has to happen in alignment with people in the U.S. demanding a more just uh, a foreign policy in their country. Uh, it has to happen in alignment with people around the world saying, "Hey, we are part of. We're all in this together at a certain level, at least." Uh, and developing internationalism and saying, "Hey, this whole structure of of uh, allowing uh, the you know our elites." To uh, to determine what happens around the world, that, that that we don't, you know, we reject that. We we have more. There's more interest between the majority of the population in Canada with the majority of the population in I don't know Ecuador than there is with with the you know the the the, the one percent within our within our country. Um, there's also I think a, a need to break down the idea, you know, certain elements, the the, the negative elements of nationalism, certainly within within Canada within the U.S. Um, but I, you know, I'm 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 uh, I'm not hopeful that that you're going to have, as you mentioned, uh, uh, you're not going to have a just Canadian foreign policy in a year and five years. I mean, you're just going to elect a new government and you're going to have a just foreign policy. I'm not hopeful that that's going to happen. But I am uh, optimistic that we can uh, and, and to certain, some extent have broken down um, uh, some of the injustices of Canadian foreign policy, and that we have the power. Certainly, things like the internet. Uh, enable us to 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 you know, understand what's happening in a way that that is quite uh, unique from a historical perspective. Um, so uh, you know, I'm 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 uh, I'm I'm engaged with you know activism on these issues beyond just uh, you know uh, trying to write about and, and criticize the issues. Engaged with different uh, uh, anti-war organizations, uh, 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 international solidarity organizations, and I invite people to wherever they live uh, to try to. Um, get engaged with those types of organizations. Before I, I ask you my last question about uh, your sites, and I think you have this new organization that you talk about in your book, completely off topic, um, <laughs> Tr uh, Justin Trudeau, Canadian Prime Minister, has been caught in this corruption scandal, and some are saying he's finished just briefly in passing. Do you think uh, anything's going to happen that he'll just, the status quo will continue or he'll be forced to resign? I don't think he'll be forced to resign, but he's clearly been politically, seriously politically weakened. Um, this, 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 what's framed as just a corruption scandal is, this, is, this, is an indication of how powerful the corporate lobby is in, in Ottawa, and it's specifically around this Canada's leading disaster capitalist corporation, SNC-Lavalin, um, and, uh, and, uh, and it's, uh, it's right at the heart of Canadian foreign policy. And the media has largely ignored that question uh, and has focused it on the very narrow of the, uh, of the government's intervention in terms of on behalf of SNC-Lavalin, but it's really a, sign, uh, really a story about corporate power in, in Ottawa and should be a story about, about Canadian foreign policy. But no, Justin Trudeau probably, he's been weakened by it, but he probably won't, uh, won't even his election's coming up in uh, five or six months. All right. And if you can tell us uh, the best places where people can uh, support you, follow you, I believe your website, eveengler.com, uh, and something you talked about at the book, that you're creating something new, foreign policy.ca. Yeah, so people can uh, check out my stuff at uh, eveengler.com. Um, one of the things that I'm, uh, as a long-term uh, political project, is try to set up this uh, uh, hub of critical information on Canadian foreign policy called the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute. Uh, the website is up at foreignpolicy.ca. It has uh, you know, a list of the best books on Canadian foreign policy. It has an uh, archive of articles on Canadian foreign policy. It's basically an attempt... Um, you know, it has potential to become a, you know, a full-fledged uh, uh, critical uh, foreign policy think tank that, you know, produces reports and has chapters across the country and stuff like that. But initially what it is, is just a, a trying to bring together uh, critical information on Canadian foreign policy, a hub of some of the critical information, uh, uh, because so much of the battle is, is, uh, is, is an information battle.
All right. I hope people check that out. I will. Uh, I just learned about it because I just finished reading uh, your book today. Thank you, Eve Engler, for coming on again uh, after five years. People should check out those websites. Uh, you are one of the few critical analysts of Canadian foreign policy and empire up north there, a very valuable resource. And I recommend people check out the books, The Black Book of Canadian Foreign Policy, Canada and Africa, Canada and Haiti, The Ugly Canadian Stephen Harper, and the latest book, Left, Right, Marching to the Beat of Imperial Canada. Thanks again, Eve. Thanks for having me. I hope you enjoyed this Geopolitics and Empire podcast and interview. I would like to remind you that our website is geopoliticsandempire.com and you can sign up for our mailing list that goes out each weekend with the latest podcast and a long collection of important news headlines. It's good to sign up for the newsletter in case we experience censorship and deplatforming. You can help the Geopolitics and Empire podcast by subscribing to and interacting with all of our channels such as YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Gab, Minds, and Steemit. You can also help us by leaving a rating and review on your favorite podcast platforms such as iTunes, CastBox, Stitcher, Spreaker, and so on. Finally, if you value our work and our mission and would like to see us continue interviewing experts from across the political spectrum, please consider leaving a one-time donation via PayPal or Bitcoin or becoming a regular monthly supporter on our Patreon. All the links can be found on geopoliticsandempire.com. Thanks for listening.